Upstream listeners, I'm excited to announce that registration is now open for the Colson Center National Conference happening May 19th through the 21st, 2023 in Indianapolis. Secure your spot at the lowest possible price by registering before January 1st at colsonconference.org. This year's theme is Earth Crammed with Heaven, an invitation to encounter God in His mighty works. Join speakers like Justin Bailey, Ryan Bomberger, Dr. Kristen Collier, and many more as we explore glories often referenced but rarely explored, the truths and beauties that claim our wonder and demand our protection. God has filled His creation with His presence. He has blessed His world with His glory. The Colson Center National Conference is an invitation to see God as He has made Himself known and to encounter Him and His mighty works. Register now at colsonconference.org. Welcome to Upstream, where we make your worldview bigger and older by taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. I'm Shane Morris. Well, today we're not really dealing with a hard question, but we do want to talk about what it means to have a bigger and older worldview during Christmas and what it means to pass that on to your children, your family, and your friends. To do that, I've invited a couple of guests who've reflected on both of those questions to a great extent. Heidi White will be a familiar name to Upstream listeners. She's a teacher, editor, podcaster, and author. She teaches humanities at St. Hilde School in Colorado Springs, and she's the managing editor of Forma Journal, as well as a contributing author, speaker, and consultant at the Searcy Institute. My colleague, Dr. Heather Peterson, is a writer and senior editor for the Colson Center. She's a former associate professor and chair of the Department of English and Literature at a Christian university. And she adds, also a huge fan of following the church calendar, especially at this beautiful time of year. Heather, Heidi, welcome to Upstream. Ah, thank you for having me. Fun to be on this. Thanks, Shane. Good to be here. I, I want to start out with my touch point on this subject of Christmas traditions and the meaning that we pass on to our family, our friends, our, our community at this time of year, especially as Christians, you know, chiefly as Christians. So in Surprise by Joy, C.S. Lewis talks about receiving this miniature garden diorama in, in a kind of cookie tin from his brother Warney when he was sick as a child and how that was his first experience, or at least the first experience he could remember with this thing he called joy. And joy for Lewis was a touchstone or a pointer to the truest things. It's something that if you follow it consistently and refuse to settle for less, will eventually lead you to God. And of course, that's the story of his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, in large part. Well, for me, my first experience, I, I immediately knew what he was talking about. It just resonated with me. And my first experience with joy happened around Christmas. The lights, the tree, the music by a bunch of you know contemporary Christian artists from Nashville, the, the, the Baptist Christmas that my parents put together with you know throwing open the windows, because in Florida, you don't close your windows in December, you open them so you can let in the cool, delightful air and turn off the AC and you know, mom just had candles and so forth out. And a lot of it looking back was very, I guess you could say it was pretty normy. It wasn't exactly complex or culturally high and informed, but it was very meaningful to me because it communicated that something very special is happening here and we are celebrating and we're coming together to mark the holiness of that occasion. So what is your ideal fondly remembered Christmas look like? What brings the two of you and your families and your friends joy and sweet memories around this time of year? My favorite thing about Christmas as a child was always Christmas Eve. And it was that solemnity that I felt at church at a Christmas Eve service with all of the candles, like the dimly lit room and the candles that we would hold and sing Christmas carols that was always so special to me. And really the only childhood memory that I have of anything being different at church during a liturgical season, because I grew up in a very, you know, kind of evangelical Protestant, everything was the same, right? So this, that 
feeling of like dimming the lights and holding a candle and singing a special song that we didn't sing any other time of the year just kind of transported me into the mystery of of the season. I, I believed in that. I believed it wasn't just an emotional experience, but it was a real profoundly spiritual and mystical one. It happened at church. And that kind of kicked off this sense of solemnity that then led into this celebratory, festive feeling of Christmas Day. And the contrast of that was significantly formative to me, even though I couldn't have put it into words, that there's this sense of Christmas Eve waiting and Christmas Day fulfillment. I love that. What about you, Heather? So what I remember the most, and I was from a really similar background, Heidi, it's just the expectation. And we did not have candles in my church. And I love, that's something I love now. I love the Christmas Eve service and I love love holding the candles. But I remember the expectation so strongly. And we had our own form of an advent calendar that we did. And I remember on Christmas morning, like my dad wouldn't let us leave the room until my mom get up, got up and my mom... My mom was always up late wrapping presents because we weren't bagging things as much back then, <laughs> right? So it would take three hours to wrap all the Christmas presents. So she would get up late and it sounds like punishment, but we would be jumping up and down, my, my siblings and I in our doorway, <laughs> right? And so by the time my mom came out of her bedroom, right? My parents' bedroom, like whoosh, like, right? It was just like, we were at the peak of excitement for for Christmas morning to start. And I would say my hope with kind of the liturgies that we've actually brought into Christmas in our family um, and the whole celebration of Advent would be that sense of expectation because of course that's right. That's That's the first coming and the second coming right there of Jesus. This, I love that you both mentioned the sense of expectation and then the the somber note that precedes Christmas. So I didn't understand growing up that there was a liturgical tradition, a background, a set of seasons that led into the feast of Christmas. So like there's a fast and there's a feast. And those two things always go together liturgically. That's why we have Lent and then we have Easter on the the other end of the, the church calendar. But the the sense of solemnity still came through in a way, in surprising ways. I mean, it really leaks through even, so I was raised Southern Baptist and it was very much what you'd call the religious spin on the American traditional cultural Christmas. And I don't mean that at all in a disparaging way. I mean it in just sort of a descriptive way that there is a, there's a, a, a broad observance that this thing called Christmas is coming. And we call when we refer to the Christmas season in a church like that, we're not really referring to December 25th through January 6th. We're actually referring to everything after Thanksgiving and sometimes a little bit before then if we're, <laughs> if we're uh, you know, really naughty. And the sense that you get from that, sometimes it can be overly saccharine and, and like, just how many more times have I got to hear Mariah Carey while I'm, while I'm shopping? It's just, this is, this is too much. It's like an overload of spiritual and mental sugar. But a lot of the Christian settings that I found myself in, including, uh, like, like we mentioned a second ago, those candlelight services in a very evangelical church. Uh, Heidi, you, you mentioned that. We had those. And there were several pieces of music that accompanied that visual somberness, the, the sobriety that we felt there. And one of them was, that stands out in my memory for some reason, is uh, Amy Grant's Breath of Heaven which is a, a song about, it's, it's Mary singing, and it's about the Holy Spirit. The song itself is rich. It's very rich. It's powerful. I don't know if she wrote it or if it's a cover. I just don't know. But it is not a, re- a song of rejoicing. It's not a song of sweetness and, and happiness and celebration. It's a song of deep, uh, almost an anticipation of sorrow. There's like a there's like a flavor of the cross in the song itself, and a fear and an uncertainty about what's coming, and so so Mary is treasuring all these things up in her heart, and pondering them, and asking why have why was I the one chosen? What's what's happening here? I'm frightened. She says I'm frightened by the load I bear, and that really spoke to me. Like I realized there's something happening here that, in, even in the middle of the celebration that we're having, even on Christmas Day, 
there's still an undercurrent of like, oh, this is serious. This is sad. This is this is a big deal. And then I, re- you know, I, eventually I connected it with the cross. And that's where we're, we're headed. So, but let's talk a little bit more about what a friend of mine called the good spookiness of Christmas. The the sense of there's something serious happening here. Where where was that for you two? And then how do you communicate it to your families and 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 those you celebrate with today? I grew up evangelical, as I said, and then converted to the Eastern Orthodox Church as an adult. We are right now in the season of Advent, which is gaining more and more traction amongst all Christian traditions in the West, which is really exciting. I love that. Advent is a season of repentance. It's a season of waiting. We are fasting, as you said. Like I haven't had, I've been eating vegan since November 15th. We don't get to taste any meat or cheese uh, until Christmas Day, because this is a season of of repentant waiting. There is a reason that Christ is coming. And the reason Christ is coming is because the world has fallen. And so we are waiting for the life of Christ to be born. The Advent season uh, historically throughout the church in the East and the West has been about focused on on Mary and the journey of the mother of God that she is selected to bear and carry the life of the world in her womb and then travailing bring forth the life of Christ uh, and in doing so cost her her reputation and she suffered greatly uh, and and we imitate her right we gaze at her we look at her in this advent season and uh, and imitate her. She is an example, not an exception, right? And uh, and so, through our imitation of her, we are denying ourselves for a season, just as a pregnant woman does, and then becoming big with child as the child takes over the body, uh, and then must be brought into the world. And there's the new life, right? And that is Christmas Day. So until then. It is a season of solemnity, a season of repentance, a season of waiting and longing, right? This this divine longing that is implanted in us as we wait for the life of Christ to come into the world for our salvation. And every year it happens, you know, knowing that it is the already and the not yet. Like this has, Christ has come uh, and he is coming. And Advent is that season in between that, that, that season of feeling the weight of that, that we are not yet what we will be. So the world is not yet restored in a physical sense as it is in a mystical sense through the life of Christ. And so Advent ought to have a, a, a feeling of, of heaviness, of longing, of, I, of, of this desire for something that has not yet come. And then the fast gives way to a feast, but we're not yet that we're not yet there. We're not there yet. And and Advent honors that and remembers that and feels the weight of that and liturgically celebrates that within the life of the church and the life of the family. I don't know, Heather, anything to add to that? Yeah. So in my current church tradition, we don't require the fasting as much, but we definitely honor it as a season of solemnity. And I would say that thinking about the just the the sense of expectation and waiting and also recognizing our own our own sin. So in my family, we use the Advent wreath as part of it. We do the opening, and I don't. I mean, I'm not sure where both of your traditions are. Uh, this is actually a Lutheran tradition, which is not my background, but where you start with the people walking in darkness, right? So one child says that. And then the rest of the family responds, have seen a great light. And then we usually cover a story of from one of the many stories beginning with creation. So from the very beginning of God's story of, of redemption all the way through. And we cover some of those Old Testament characters who are in the line of Jesus, like Rahab, but who are clearly sinners too, like we all are, <laughs> right? So I really agree and love what you just said. Even though we don't fast from food, my husband and I are, we, di- we didn't put up the Christmas tree until the week of joy. Um, in the Advent season, the third week is traditionally the week of joy. 
So that gave us a couple weeks not to do that. Um, another way we try to do that, or at least I've tried to do that, is uh, we tr I try to have my girls and I listen to, to music that is more about Jesus' coming and isn't celebrating that the coming has happened. So we don't listen to Joy to the World, right? We listen to O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. <laughs> and we usually only get to do about that, that about a week before my husband's ready for Nat King Cole or <laughs> Bing Crosby. But at least we start <laughs> we start that way at the beginning of, of Advent season, remembering that it's a, a season of waiting. And we really try to build up that idea of, of waiting. I really love that, Heather. And I love that you're bringing up the practical applications of some of these big spiritual ideas, right? For those of us who didn't necessarily grow up with these liturgical traditions, either in the church or in the home, as, as the church in the West is recovering a vision for that and wanting to integrate those ideas into the life of the family and the life of the church, uh, I love that you're bringing up these ideas on like how to do that. How in the world do we do that, right? If we're in this season of waiting and yet kids are full of Christmas cookies at their Christmas parties and everywhere they go, it's jingle bells and, you know, and, and, and the world thinks it's Christmas, but for us, it's not quite yet Christmas, right? We get the 12 days of Christmas that begin on December 25th. We don't necessarily want to come back to the joy in the, in, in the realm, but we want to, we want to cultivate that spirit of waiting in a culture that doesn't really understand that, right? And so I love that you're bringing up some ways, you know, the, the Christmas wreath, the Advent wreath, the lighting of the candles, the devotions. There are so many good resources available uh, on that for people who are looking to integrate those ideas more into their family culture, which I think is amazing. I love that. We're all three parents here, and that raises a very important question for me. I think we've kind of skirted on this, but the cultural observance of what we call Christmas in America it is really a, a a giant glut of festivity that begins after Thanksgiving and really ends uh, when the sun goes down on December 25th. And then the actual Christmas season gets uh, squashed in a, a sort of malaise of like dizziness and cheese and leftovers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like I, I saw a meme. It said, you know, December 25th to January 1st is just a, you don't know what time it is. You don't know what day it is. You don't really remember your name that much. It's just like, it's just like this sleeping and napping and cheese and like playing with toys and stuff. And that's what's, that's what it's become. And it's supposed to be the, the actual liturgical season of Christmas and the celebration and so forth. But look, the reality is we live in this culture. We have these neighbors. They're doing this stuff. They're inviting us to white elephant parties and they've got finger foods and they've got punch and they've got uh, the whole nine yards. It makes me wonder, you know, how do we teach our kids? If, if we want to go the route of being very serious about observing these um, liturgical seasons and actually fasting, right? We want to actually do this the way that our, our bodies are involved in the act of worship as Christians have for millennia. How do you convince your kids that, they should uh, have to sit out the fun and the deliciousness until a certain time. I and mean, what is the tool you use to teach them that? Well, we fast about half the year. Between four to five, it's four and a half to six months, depending on how observant you are. Uh, there's no fasting police. So there's plenty of, of Orthodox Christians that, that don't observe all of the fasts and that's completely fine or take exceptions or, you know, pregnant women, nursing mothers, young children aren't necessarily expected to. But for us, we, we understand as Shane just so wisely pointed out that we live in an existing culture and we are embedded within that and part of it. And so I think for all Christian families that are attempting to cultivate a more liturgical lifestyle, in a culture that's frankly hostile to it and doesn't understand it, that hasn't been always the way it was. Like in medieval times, you couldn't even find cheese during Lent, right? Um, so these are this is we live in a different culture. So there's always that harmony between, say, like go to the class Christmas party and eat what is put before you with a joyful heart and rejoice and be glad that God has given you good things. But at home, we're going to keep the fast, right? And that's part of our job as a family. That's part of my role as a parent uh, is to set the culture around the life of Christ and the life of the church uh, and to maintain that while at the same time teaching teaching that 
without teaching legalism, right? But but also saying like, we are not holy because we fast. We fast because we long for Christ and because we love the feast. Like I can't wait for that Christmas brunch, right? And if you eat that cheeseburger, then the Christmas brunch isn't going to feel as joyful and happy, right? And and just that sense of, of fulfillment after a long fast. But I think the the whole point of fasting anyway is to represent what Shane said is to represent in the body to embody the spiritual principle. You know, it is not to save us. It's not works righteousness. It is to say, as I am waiting for my Christmas, my creme brulee French toast that I make every year on Christmas morning, and we all drink a glass, a small glass of champagne, right? Even the kids, like just a little bit, right? Then as we're waiting for that. Right. Then I am also embodying waiting and with, with my body. I'm doing it with my body. So in a season, as you pointed out, the candles, right? It's the same thing. Um, because those who have walked in darkness will see a great light. Therefore we dim the lights in the dining room and we light a single beeswax candle and we pray the same prayer every day uh, as we are waiting. And we let the music be more solemn. We can cultivate that in our homes, even though it's not out there. And just even that contrast, like I don't, even that contrast of like here in the home, we're doing something that's different than in the culture. Even that is formative. And so we have this opportunity as parents to say, if everything means something, which is the message of the Christ, of the church calendar, everything means something, right? If that's true, then how, what is it that I want this to mean? If I know that the contrast is they're going to go out and be thrown eggnog on the corner, <laughs> on the corner and told to buy stuff. Which for the record, I love, and I know feelings are strong on both directions about eggnog. I don't know why, because it's obviously I amazing. I am pro eggnog. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I am pro eggnog. And if they're given, you know, if we get eggnog at a Christmas party and I drink a small glass, right? That's fine. It's not about legalism, but it is about we are not the culture. We are Christians and Christians live differently. And this is one way we live differently and intentionally, even in these tiny little ways. This goes to the next question. And I want to pitch this to you, Heather. We share a story here. All three of us really share to some extent a story of hopping through different uh, traditions and experiencing different ways of observing or not observing Christmas slash Advent. So I want to hear, Heather, what you think has remained constant over that time period. And then what is perhaps your goal for, you know, uniting your experience with the experience that your kids are having and that you're currently having as a member of the uh, congregation where you currently worship? I mean, what can you look back on and say, this has remained constant. These things have changed, but here's the common theme or core that I've carried with me. Hmm. Okay. I appreciate that question. So, so a few of the things that remained constant for me is especially when I was younger, right? It was a time for family. Um, there were sweet traditions uh, that were passed on, like the idea of an orange, right? Symbolizing gold being in my stocking. <laughs> All right. And also because an orange was a big deal a long time ago, right? To get an orange orange for, for Christmas. Growing up in Florida, oranges were never a big deal. <laughs> they were in Iowa. <laughs> so <laughs> also I think for my mom who who grew up really who pretty much grew up in, in poverty, it was a it was a huge deal. So passing on some of those traditions. And then we the way I grew up there was sort of an avoidance of anything that felt liturgical because that felt like works, right? Uh, and that's something, of course, where I I changed a lot. When God drew me toward a church, at the time what he drew me toward was, I was like, Lord, I want to go to a church where there is some symbol every Sunday. There's communion every Sunday. That's how I addressed it. I didn't understand concepts of sacrament yet or anything like that. And of course, what I found is most churches like that are churches that that celebrate the church year. And one of the things that I would say that God started doing in me is once, and I fell in love with the liturgy too, 
was recognizing kind of the things that Heidi just said that what the church calendar does for me and what doing liturgy with my kids does for us as a family is it's a way to inhabit the story. Right? It's a way to inhabit God's story. And especially in a culture that is so against the story, for me as an academic, it was a way to like, instead of all the Instead of all the focus being on my grading at the end of the term, right, the, the fall term, like it gave me the opportunity to like think again about Christmas. And I would even say the church year and the liturgy because it re-enchanted Christmas for me because it helped me, helped give me back um, that expectation again, because I felt like once I became an adult, I sort of lost the enchantment of Christmas. And I would say the big change happened actually when I brought home my older daughter at the end of October. It was October 28th. And I brought her home from the hospital. And and I, I'm going to have a Narnia reference, Jane. You're going to love this. <laughs> so, if you didn't do it, I, w- I was going to do it. So okay. go ahead. <laughs> and... I just remembered on the drive home, my husband's driving. I just thought, we're, we're Father Christmas. We're bringing Christmas right now to our neighborhood. <laughs> like, I mean, it just felt so much joy in bringing home a child. And that's when Christmas started being kind of re-enchanted for me, as well as along with the liturgy. And of course, then involving my daughters, my two daughters, and a lot of more C- Christmas traditions than I had actually, or Advent traditions, I should say. Um, and all year round church calendar traditions than I had practiced when I was growing up. But yeah, inhabiting the story. I want my kids to inhabit the story because in this culture, there is a loss of meaning, which you and I have talked a lot about <laughs> in our roles at the Colson Center. And this is this is the story I want them to live in. And that's what the liturgical observance, the calendar itself is all about. I mean, I talked with uh, Ken Boa last year, and, and many of my listeners will remember that episode. And he gave a, an explanation, a crash course, and a kind of defense of the whole idea of keeping an annual uh, calendar of worship as, a, as the people of God and as the, as the church of God, right? The whole point of it is to embody the story, like you're saying, Heather. It's to, it's to live out the experience, in many ways, uh, reflecting on the life of Jesus cyclically every single year, you know, his, his entire experience from birth to death and resurrection. And I think you're exactly right when you mentioned the aversion to that having to do in part with a fear of ritual, works, righteousness, or what's often unfortunately used pejoratively today, the word religion, right? The word religion has for many people taken on a pejorative connotation. And that's that's terrible. I mean, don't get me started on the the abuse and um, destruction of perfectly good words. But religion is one of those words that's fallen prey to that. And so I know people, I love people who would look at some of the things that we're talking about here and say, ah, that's, that's, that's a legalistic religious practice. And we don't and shouldn't do that because it takes away from the simplicity of the gospel. Now, I, I, I hail from a, well, currently, I, I should say, I grew up Baptist, but I currently hail from a uh, Presbyterian and Reformed setting. And obviously there's a long history of conflict in that tradition over whether and how much we should observe these things. So all the way to the the sort of covenanter Puritan side of things where it was completely abolish all these holidays and just observe Sunday. The, the, The Lord's day and worship is the only thing we do. We do nothing else in the way of holidays and so forth. And then there's more moderate uh, versions of it. So you see that embodied in things like the Second Helvetic Confession, which is an early uh, reform confession. And they, they, it, it says of the celebration of the Lord's uh, nativity and death and resurrection and so forth, we do highly approve. And it's, you, you know, there's a, so there's a variety of practices there. And then the Anglican tradition, which is very much informed by reform thinking in many ways. If you don't believe that, read the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles. You know, Archbishop Cranmer is is injecting all this stuff into the tradition, but it's much more comfortable with the entire. In fact, it's based on a on observance of an ancient and in some sense reformed liturgy. And so there's a 
by no means a, a sort of unanimity on this from, from my background, but I understand what you're saying. I get the hesitation and, and I even in some sense can feel it still. It took me a long time to get over that instinct. How do you, Heidi, how did you get over that if you ever had it? And how do you talk to people about the goodness and non legalism? You know, the, the fact that this is actually a gracious thing that we're doing, not a legalistic thing to celebrate with our bodies, with our time, with our meals, with our, you know, observable rituals. What do you say? Yeah, I think that, of course, I, I grew up with, I, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but there seems to be a consensus amongst thoughtful Christians who are, who are recovering some of these liturgical ideas and implementing them in families and in a more communal church setting as well, whether or not they're converting wholesale like I, like we did in our family, right? Um, and so even amongst the three of us, there's, there's three, experiences of leaning into liturgical life, right? But yeah, I was raised with a with a distrust of that, which is exactly the same thing that you guys said that it was about works righteousness. And as the, you know, token representative on this panel of, you know, the liturgical tradition, the wholesale acceptance of the liturgical tradition, I roundly condemn works righteousness and I am I I am the chief of sinners. I could never be saved by my works. And so thank the Lord that I don't have to be. I'm saved entirely by by grace. I am being saved by grace and by faith. But I am also being saved in my body, which means that my body must reflect that salvation. And it must reach for that salvation and yearn for it, right? To work out my salvation in fear and trembling. And we have an example historically throughout time of how the church has done that from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, the church has done that through feasting and fasting, through liturgy, uh, through the movement of the body in church, right? Like in, in our church, we stand throughout the entire liturgy and we sing the entire liturgy. And when we fast, we fast hard. And when we feast, we feast hard. You should see us on Pascha. That's what we say for Easter. Like we're, we're up. Eating burgers at two in the morning and dancing and singing and, and drinking wine together and telling jokes. And so we feast and we fast with all of our being, uh, because I, my entire being is being saved. And, you know, I, I recently heard a sermon from a pastor who said, you know, I have, I am a soul, right? And I, I'm wearing this earth suit and someday I will be delivered from my earth suit and I will, you know, dwell with God. But the incarnation belies that theology. Christ put on a body and he followed the traditions of his people. And, and when he was raised again, when he went, well, when he rose himself, right? He pulled himself out of death. Uh, met, there are other people who have been resurrected by God. Christ is God. So he pulled himself up from death. That's how powerful he is. And he kept his body. He ate and drank with his disciples and he was raised in the body to be seated in the body at the right hand of God. And so therefore we ought to worship God with our bodies. Uh, and some of that means denial, right? We, like, I sp we speak of chastity. Some of that is to say no to our bodies. That's why we fast, right? I heard a, um, a priest tell me, an Anglican priest uh, said, the most, one of the most profound things that I've ever heard. Uh, he said, if you want your children to be chaste, put them in piano lessons. And I love that. What he was saying is... If you want us to be able, if we want to be able to say no to our bodies, we have to say yes to the right things, right? We say yes to, if we're playing piano. I mean, of course, that's a metaphor, but what he's saying is piano is beautiful. Say yes to that. And piano requires limitations. We must practice. We must say no to worthless things so that we say yes to this thing, right? And that's what the cycles of feasting and fasting teach us. And Advent is such a wonderful way to absorb that that we're longing for the appearing of Christ. And in doing that, we're saying no to these things so that we can say yes to the better things. And that is what the church calendar, and that's what the liturgical traditions are all about. It's not about being saved through them. It's about the imitation of the life of Christ in our bodies, in our souls, in our traditions, in our churches, and in our families. 
I also want to say just when it comes to to liturgy is that I read the the Bible in a year. You know that remember the Bible that Bible in a year, right? I did that for years. And that's all liturgy is. <laughs> I mean, it's just it, it's it's just being intentional about scripture and that really by reading through the the Bible through a year plan for years, I was following my own liturgy. But by now following the church year, I'm joining with the historic church um, and being just as intentional. So one of the things that's sort of at variance in the the different forms of the church calendar is how full it is of the constellation of the saints, right? Like how many of these these other days do we observe this, that aren't directly about Jesus? They're about some other Christian, you know, some other Christian figure over the course of of two thousand years who has merited uh, remembrance and and mention. Now, Heather, you mentioned this idea of saints that are particularly associated with this time of year, and that we could work into the the you know the pedagogy at home, and then obviously at church as well. Could you talk to us about some of those? And then particularly, here's what I'm thinking: we have this. There's this one saint that our culture loves to observe in, in some sort of distorted way. And uh, most of them don't even realize that he's a saint. So how do you connect that weird secular remembrance of there being saints that are meaningful in the calendar and in this time of the calendar with the real men and women who were remembering in some sense? As far as the church year, what you just said, Shane, uh, this idea of the the saints, and I, I think I had talked about it earlier, but I think that was before we're we're recording. And so we we celebrate two saints. Um, I'm actually from, I'm not Dutch, but I actually am from uh, a Dutch community that was my hometown in Iowa. If you've ever heard of of Pella, got a fabulous tulip time in May. <laughs> if you if you want a little vacation uh, for your family, don't pick the tulip so you'll get fined fifty dollars. So <laughs> anyway, but they celebrated St. Nicholas Day there. And my family, again, my family didn't enter a lot of those things because of where my parents were at the time, because I think they would have probably have seen it as as a work and wouldn't understand honoring saints. So my parents did have a book about who St. Nicholas truly was, which I really loved as a young person. But for me, we celebrate both St. Nicholas on December 6th, and we celebrate St. Lucia on the 13th, uh, which is part of both my husband and my Swedish traditions. Although again, we had pietistic covenant and Baptist families who didn't acknowledge <laughs> acknowledge that, even though we both have immigrant great-grandparents uh, from, from Sweden. And it was something that I really wanted to gift to my kids. And it's something that connects kids to where we are in our culture today, because I feel like we are in a time where our culture is very critical of Christians. I feel like it's almost as my daughter said to me recently, it's almost like the time of Nero in that Christians get blamed for things, <laughs> right? Stochiastic terrorism is a thing now, apparently. Yeah, exactly. And that's when I explained that to my 13-year-old, she's like, oh, it's like the time of Nero. Christians are being blamed for the fire, even if they didn't cause it. And so by connecting them to St. Nicholas and to St. Lucia, who suffered persecution, during the the time of Diocletian, the Emperor Diocletian, like it gives them a story that they can model, right? It's one that they can model too, because they were both persecuted, and they both stood up for their faith, and and of course with Saint Lucy, I love the fact that she was called to be celibate because I think that is a calling for for some women, and our culture doesn't teach that at all. <laughs> Now, Heather, you mentioned a second ago, St. Lucia, and I think that you had said before that she was single throughout her life. This brings up a topic that you had mentioned bef before we ever started recording this that you wanted to discuss, and that was the place of single celibate Christians in the, not, not only the church, but in the church in this time of year. Because the reason this is important to ask, I think, is because Christmas has become 
very deeply associated with the family, right? The being with your family on Christmas. And that's not to suggest that single people don't have families. I mean, there are lots of tragic circumstances that can leave you uh, literally alone on Christmas, I imagine, as far as family is concerned. But the family is centered on this uh, you know, idea of marriage and you have kids and there's an idyllic picture of gathering around the Christmas tree, Christmas morning to open the presents with the kids. And many people will not have that. So how do you go about incorporating the celebration of Christmas into the life of a godly single person? What does that look like? So for the single themselves, right? There are lovely Advent devotionals to help them prepare for that sense of expectation for the the first and, and second coming. And one of my favorite ones is actually edited by um, John Whitfleet and includes these wonderful sermons from the early church fathers through, I think, Calvin and <laughs> kind of pulls you into the whole story. But then as a family who wants to incorporate singles, because I was 34 and my husband was 38 when we got married, we really believe strongly in inviting singles into our home as much as possible. And so in the past, um, we're still making friends in Colorado Springs, but in the past, uh, we have two Christmas trees and we would make them part of our our Christmas tradition and that we would have one friend who would come and help us decorate one tree and we just have appetizers and fun things to drink and and so on and then we would have another friend who would come and decorate help us decorate the second tree and sometimes they end up being the people <laughs> like we're so we're listening to Christmas carols and they're the kind enough people to unwind all our lights for us <laughs> but um but we invite them we invite them into that tradition because I think one of the hardest thing for singles can be Christmas because it can be a time where they can they go to a celebration and they just sit there while while all the grandkids get their photos, <laughs> you know. And I, I we want them to be part of our Advent and our Christmas. And we've invited a friend over this Christmas, and we'll see if he's able to come too. That's great. Heidi, what are your thoughts on the incorporating of singles into the celebration of Christmas? And, and then, of course, the observance of Advent leading up to that. How do we, how do we keep from implying that, that people who aren't married don't have a place around the you know, Christmas table, so to speak? Yeah, I really like that question, Shane. And I really appreciated what you said, Heather, about your intentionality uh, it's a really interesting kind of flip historically because in the early church all the way up through medieval times, the perception was different. It was that the people who weren't married were more like the quote unquote real Christians, right? And uh, celibacy was celebrated as particularly spiritual and chastity was upheld as a sign uh, or a uh, a manifestation of true piety. You know, to, to uphold monasticism over marriage is perhaps going too far, but also to uphold uh, marriage over the chaste life uh, and the power of being able to, to, of the individual who can orient all of their love and longing to Christ in the church. Uh, we need to regain an understanding of how truly beautiful that life is. Uh, and and so I agree uh, because Christmas tends to be a time of traditions within the family. Uh, and so to bring in people who are living out that that life of chastity uh, and who have the time maybe to um, and the effort that the energy to to do things that married people don't right, and then also to model what it looks like to be in that loving relationship and to create that space of hospitality. Uh, and an integration of those multiple streams of true Christian piety and lifestyle within underneath the single household is exactly what the church does. And the and the family is the little church. Uh, and so we must, we must regain a vision for chastity and the monastic life, whether it's lived out in a monastery or within or within the world, is uh we must regain that and present that uh not only as valid, but as a way of being a Christian that provides something that marriage does not. 
Uh, and, and in choosing one good path and choosing marriage, you're choosing what you can't have in, a, in the life of chastity In choosing a life of chastity, then you're choosing something that marriage can, you, you're giving something up either way. And so we must then show each other what that looks like within the body of Christ. Yeah. I think part of what makes this so difficult, and I, I really appreciate that answer, Heidi. Part of what makes this so difficult is that the category of person you're talking about has um, vanished from culture writ large. The idea that someone um, would be A, unmarried, and B, celibate, right? They would be chaste. They would not be, uh, ch they'd be chaste instead of chasing their desire, the desires of the flesh, as the culture tells them to do, is very alien. And so if you're, you know, if you're single, you must want to be in a relationship, number one, but then you must also be pursuing it in the world's way. To be a Christian, Who's actually said no? I'm. I've dedicated myself to uh, th the life of piety, of godliness, in light of his design for sexuality. Like I'm going to obey his rules and do it his way. That's a rare thing nowadays, which is why you know modern monasteries and and, and uh, convents are so few and far between. That sort of thing has has fallen out of favor, regardless of what your theological ideas are on the whole concept of monasticism that has colored Christian history. And it's not the same thing as what mo most modern people think of as singlehood. So I, like, I'm a big believer in, the, in getting young Christians married because I think marriage is a holy and, uh, and good estate and not enough people are getting married, right? And, and I very much share Martin Luther's kind of emphasis on that over and against the monastic tradition. So we'd probably diverge on that. Oh, another podcast idea, Shane. Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the the takeaway on this discussion is there are singles in, in uh, the church today who are trying to obey God's rules. And there's no reason at all why they should be second class citizens in the, in the church or the celebration of Christmas or in the anticipation of Christmas that we're in right now in Advent. So I do appreciate that. That's a good, important addendum to add there. As we finish up here, I did want to throw one more question out and, and I'll give this to you, Heather, because we've kind of discussed this a little bit over you know recent weeks, but the family emphasis that happens around Christmas can be tough, not only for singles, but for families, because the more you come to uh, believe that your kids should be benefiting from this event and this observance and this tradition and 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 this means of of teaching them the christmas story you can hit a brick wall as a parent because it's hard to do all those things my wife wants to take the whole family to a performance of handel's messiah tonight but we just did a thing last night and um i'm kind of tired and i don't know that i, <laughs> I want to take all four kids to this thing as good as it is. So how do you see parents around Christmas drawing a line there? How, how, do you, how do you keep from going overboard to where it becomes, like we talked about earlier, a bit legalistic? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And probably it's different for each family. I actually, it's really, it's interesting you say that, Shane, just because my husband, the one who's like, Heather, it's enough. <laughs> so I appreciate his voice. But for us, there are so many good things that we could be doing right now. There's a Christmas market I want to go to, a European Christmas market. Um, there's a Flemish exhibit I want to go to in the Denver Museum, right? There's a live nativity I want to drive up to. And I actually don't think we're going to do any of those three things. I think with the level of busyness right now, with having kids my age, it has to be connected to church or it has to be connected to school. And maybe we could have room for one other thing. And that kind of has to, has to be it for us. Because if we're all tired and crabby, we are not going to be entering Advent or Christmas well. <laughs> I think that's right. I think that we have to remember our our goal, our telos, right? Like the, the the purpose of Christmas is the life of Christ. It is not to have the picture perfect Instagram life, and it's it's not to it's not sentimentality. Like Christmas is a time. I'm a very sentimental person, and I like traditions for the sake of the sentimentality and uh, the feeling that I get. 
But remembering that that feeling is always, to use another Narnia reference, the feeling is always the wardrobe, right? That it's not the goal. It's not the magical land. We're looking towards the kingdom. And so especially mothers, especially those of us Christian moms who want to do everything because we just love it so much and it's so sweet and darling and it makes such great pictures and it feels so good. We have to remember that all of this is for the sake of the kingdom of God, not for the sake of that sentimental feeling. That's always been a shadow of the real thing, which is the joy uh, of Christ. And, and that's how you began the podcast is a reminder that we are, we are not chasing the perfect Christmas. We are chasing the joy of Christ. And that has to be our guide and our boundary. That's beautiful. I couldn't agree more. Well, my guests today have been Heidi White, teacher, editor, podcaster, and author, and Heather Peterson, one of my colleagues here at the Colson Center, senior writer and editor. Heidi, Heather, thank you so much for this conversation. This has been, uh, a joy and i'm looking forward to celebrating christmas with all of this in mind thanks for having us i loved it i loved it upstream is a program of the colson center when it comes to the hardest questions we ask we have thousands of years of accumulated wisdom from which to draw from a faith that is the explanation of all reality so come upstream and learn to understand the world the church and the god who has placed you in them Connect with us on social media or find more resources at upstream.colsoncenter.org.